Hello, everyone, and welcome to Senior <laughs> Wednesday. I'm Samantha. I'm the lead educator. Um, and welcome to April Senior Wednesday. So our Senior Wednesday programs are January through October at 10 a.m. on the fourth Wednesday of every month. So we've got a good lineup this year. And our Senior Wednesday programs are funded in part by generous gifts from the Trust Company of Kansas and Mickey Armstrong and through the support of the museum's friends organization, WIMS. We also thank the museum members, the city of Wichita, and the board of Sedgwick County Commissioners for their support of the museum. And um, so today, we're talking about the exhibition Myths of the West, narrating stories of the land and people through Wichita Art Collections, which features art from various local institutions and collections, brought together by the Ulrich to highlight three key themes. One, the mythologizing of the Wild West in popular culture obscured the more complicated history that was happening. Two, um, the central role Kansas played in the stories of the American West in the mid to late 1800s. And three, the tragedy of changes forced on Native Americans by settler colonial expansion and how this continues to impact Native communities today. And more than half of the works in this show were by Native artists, so highlighting different Native perspectives. And here to talk with us about the exhibition is Ksenia Gerstein. Ksenia has been the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Ulrich for over four years. And she has also had curatorial positions at the National Gallery of Art in DC and the Skirbel Cultural Center in LA. And she has been published in various exhibition catalogs, books, and web journals. And she received her PhD in the history of art at the University of Michigan. Her research interests include Central and Eastern European art, with her dissertation examining conceptual art in Eastern Europe. And she has been a personal mentor for me, and Wichita is super lucky to have her. So please welcome Ksenia. <laughs> Nope. Is it on? It should be on. Put it in your mouth. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> check, check, check. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you so much, Sam. Um, it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to see all of you guys. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so it's going to be very informal if you have questions at any point along the way. Um, feel free to raise your hand and ask them or comments. Um, Sam and I are going to sort of have a very fairly casual conversation. Sam invited me to talk about this show, which has come down. So the dates were uh, August to December of last year. So it's pretty recent. It's not on view anymore. But as Sam said, what part of the point of the project was to pull together works from local collections, so to look at how is our regional history as part of the American West represented in the holdings of the institutions right here in Wichita. We didn't borrow anything from the Historical Museum, but we, we, it was works from the Ulrich, the Wichita Art Museum, the Art of Empire's collection, and the Holmes Museum of Anthropology on campus were the four local lenders, and then we had just a handful of loans from individuals and institutions outside of Wichita. Um, but the upside of it being local is that a lot of the work is still here, and if you become really interested in seeing it or learning more about it, um, the, there is a full checklist of the exhibition in the back of the brochure that you guys got, and um, also I'm available as a resource to answer questions about that. Um, so the project came out, um, as Sam said, I've been here for about four years. I grew up in Colorado, so I'm not after we moved there from Russia, so I'm not completely new to the West, but um, we moved when I was 13, and then I was busy doing other things. My uh, PhD was focused on Eastern Europe, and so when I moved here, I didn't feel like I had a very good sense of what Kansas was as a place, what its history was as a place, and so this project grew in large part out of my personal curiosity about all of that, and um, wanting to connect to it and then discovering that um, I think other people would benefit from the things I was discovering as well. Um, and when Sam invited me to talk here, what we did was um, go through the historical museum and the exhibitions on view here because there is so much overlap and in interests and kind of discover things here that connect with the themes and of what my exhibition did. And so that's what we'll do. We'll pair kind of what you can find throughout the historical museum 
with what uh, you could see in Myths of the West and talk about si both similarities and differences in how that material can be displayed and interpreted and discussed. That's why I'm here and not hiding in the back like normal. <laughs> She's putting me to work. <laughs> um, one thing that was really important for us, um, this was prominently displayed as sort of the first thing as you walked into the exhibition. It's now on our museum website. Um, and it was valuable work, I feel like, for us to do was to develop an indigenous people's acknowledgement that sort of comes out up front and says that um, it's a very complicated and um, often tragic history that led to us and our ancestors living on, the, and on this land and to acknowledge that there was habitation by people for um, hundreds if not thousands of years before. Um, should I read it or should I let people read it? You can read it. I just okay. um, the city of Wichita occupies the traditional homelands and hunting and camping territories of several Native American nations, including the Kiowa, Kaw, Osage, Wichita, the people of the Seven Council Fires, and many other indigenous caretakers of this land and water. Today, the state of Kansas remains home to four federally recognized tribes, Prairie Band Potawatomi Nation, Kickapoo Tribe in Kansas, Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri and Kansas and Nebraska. This land and water are deeply connected to the vibrant cultures of indigenous people past, present, and future. As a cultural institution that seeks to connect with the entirety of its diverse community, the Ulrich Museum is honored to present, collect, and support art that represents indigenous perspectives. We also recognize our responsibility to help dismantle legacies of invisibility and injustice against indigenous people through conversation, representation, and education. And I, this was also a statement of uh, kind of suggesting to visitors that a large part of the exhibition project, not exclusively, but a significant part, was uh, to center the perspectives of Native American artists and Native American people, which we as an institution historically had not done. I looked through our records and this exhibition I think was the first of its kind in that way. There was a major exhibition in the 1970s that was dedicated to the West and to a man and they were all men. <laughs> it was, you know, it was Charles Russell and, um, Reming and Frederick Remington and all the people mm -hmm. we associate with Western art, right, who represented that history. And that is, you know, that is part of the history of representing the West, but that's not the entirety of the history. And so this was a way of us saying that we want to center a different set of perspectives. Um, this is what you saw. Uh, there will be a few installation shots throughout as you entered the show. Um, and this was a painting that came from Wham that I, also, that I really liked. and. Um, also, it was on the so this on the flip side of that first front wall was this painting, and called Moments from 1976. So it was one of the many many things that were produced in the bicentennial year. There was you know a whole kind of big nation nationwide push for celebrations around the 200 um, anniversary of the establishment of America. And um, what I appreciated about this work is the way that it sort of makes so visible the presence of the past and the present. It places all these historical figures and artifacts into the present day landscape. I was very grateful to people who helped me identify the exact spot where this is. It's at the corner of uh, looking, is there a pointer here? I think so. How do I activate it? The red button, the red. Ah, okay. Uh, so this is looking, this is the corner of Douglas and St. Francis, so that was cool. Um, and, and I guess one thing that I've been thinking about as I was going through the historical museum and thinking about my project, the cool thing that I think working with art right, rather than strictly historical artifacts allows you to do is um, it allows you to get at ideas that are harder to represent with just literal objects. So I think I'll, I'll point out a number of objects like that or another of artworks. You know, it gets at something abstract that the, pre that the past, that the knowledge of the past is present with us um, even if we literally cannot see, you know, historical figures in the landscape. But like to me, ever since I moved to Wichita, it was significant that I would drive down Douglas and I'd see like, oh, this is the, the same path that the Chisholm Trail took. Like that was, um, that made my experience of this place much richer and much more, um, made me feel much more connected to, you know, people a hundred years ago. 
Um, you want to talk about this? Yeah, so uh, this is on our third floor right when you walk upstairs. And the historical museum really starts with the history of settling Wichita. We don't go super far back into the natives that were here before. We do touch on it, but um, so this kind of uh, highlights the beginning of our sort of timeline upstairs. In, and it was the Little Arkansas Treaty um, signed October 12th, 1865, and it was basically signed to get um, the native tribes that were here out of the area. Um, they were really signing it for safety reasons. They didn't want to be um, attacked anymore. They wanted to be able to cross the Arkansas River, or the Arkansas River, um, and um, Black Kettle, who was uh, Cheyenne, was a main component in the signing. So. Um, and when I went upstairs, um, I, I find the image significant, and I appreciate that the didactic up there identifies um, in the individuals who are de being depicted here. Mm -hmm. But there's also a big panel, which is, it, sh it could be in a bigger font, <laughs> with <laughs> slightly less dense. But if you actually read it start to finish, it says what the people present there said, and it's deeply moving. Yeah. Um, like I was nearly in tears reading it, and what Black Kettle said, and like what the what the what the native leaders at the meeting said repeatedly, you know, is that we're signing this treaty because of the Sand Creek massacre in Colorado, because yeah. there'd recently been a large um, massacre. And they wanted to avoid that kind of violence against themselves in the future. Which was ironic because then Black Kettle ended up dying by General Custer. Yes. Killed him. Yeah. And, and just, so actually. And he had been such a seminal person in this and then was like, oops. Right, and that's, so that, that's, that's exactly right. So I think yeah, once you start going down that history, there's a lot of really sad echoes and really sad connections. So Black Kettle, who was present there, um, I'll go over, pass over this um, work in just a minute. Um, this was one of the works um, that we had in our show. And it's subtle. When you first look at it, you wouldn't think that this is talking about deeply tragic history. It's called, uh, it's by a Native American artist who died tragically young in the 1970s, um, T.C. Cannon. Um, it's called Grandmother Gestating Father and the Washita River Runs Ribbon-like. But what I think it's talking about, or at least this is how I interpreted it, is you know multi-generational memory that doesn't go away. And the artist is depicting himself in utero as, uh, or actually not, not, even, not even in utero. He doesn't even exist, right? He's depicting his father as in utero. He's connecting to his grandmother. But that reference, you know, the artist very consciously chooses to um, mention the Washita River. Um, the Washita River is in Oklahoma. It's um, near where T.C. Cannon grew up, and um, it was the site of one of the major massacres in 1867, and it was uh, General Custer who led the massacre of a large encampment where Black Kettle, who was depicted in the earlier image, was one of the leaders and died. The other work that we had in the show related to that history was this piece, which has a complex history of its own, um, by an artist named Gina Adams who set out to um, physically recreate the texts, not the entirety of the texts, but excerpts um, uh, of the texts of all the, uh, the texts of all the treaties that the U.S. government had signed with various native tribes um, starting in the 18th century, I believe, um, if not earlier, if not the 17th. Um, this is the one that's in the collection of our museum that we acquired, and uh, we chose this one in particular because this treaty, the, the Three Medicine Lodge, there were three treaties, uh, were signed here in Kansas, again, sort of uh, highlighting the centrality of our state to this history, and actually the other two quilts of the treaty signed on the same day are at the Norman Museum and at the Spencer Museum. So all three of those treaty quilts are in the state of Kansas at University Art Museums, which is interesting. Um, but Gina Adams's big point is that, and she, you know, she sort of very painstakingly recreates the text. She uses historical quilts, so she actually buys 19th century quilts and then disassembles them. Um, 
and or 19th century blankets and uses them to cut out the letters. And she goes through this painstaking, laborious process sort of to really um, inve investigate the language, but her larger point is almost all of these treaties were broken. And they were often broken, and all the historians I've read on this say they were broken by both sides, but the ramifications of the US government breaking the treaties tended to be much more serious and significant. It led to serious starvation, it led to displacement, it led to a large-scale murder. Um, so, um, we, yeah. Um, so then when you walk into, uh, our third floor gallery, the Magic City, this is sort of the first, um, image that you can see on the left, and this is, um, C.A. Seward's painting, and he painted it in 1920, but he painted it according to, um, accounts, witness accounts that were there, um, so, he didn't go off of photographs or him being in there there in person, but he was interviewing people who still lived in Wichita who were there very early. And the Munger House is that first um, building right there. And then um, behind that is like the first church that was built in Wichita. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so this is the Munger House and then the church back here. Um, and, um, Basically, uh, it was St. John's Episcopal Church was there. Um, yeah, it was the first church in Wichita. But so this is like very early Wichita, like the first few buildings that were built. Um, and sort of as a counterpoint to that painting, I wanted to show this one, which um, again, I think part of the difficulty with interpreting or telling the story of native presence in a place like Wichita is that um, there's often very little permanent that remains, right? But that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Right. Um, and uh, Black Bear Boson, I'd say we'll talk about him, and there is a big panel uh, right over here um, dedicated to him, um, I think captures something really poignant um, about the displacement. Um, I don't actually, now that I think about it, I don't know if he's depicting a very specific uh, tribe or more. Yeah, I don't think Wham says what yeah. specific tribe it is. Um, but um, displacement of native people. This was a painting um, created, and I find this. I found this was another piece of like Wichita history that I was really fascinated to learn in researching this show. Um, so this painting was created. It was a commission by Wham uh, from Black Bear Boson. They made he had a major show there, and uh, in in 1965. And, um, but it was created five years before Century Two even opened. Like the construction would have barely begun and he's depicting both Century Two and the uh, library over here. <laughs> but they would have existed only in uh, blueprints at best. So mm -hmm. it's, it's about both imaginary, it's about the artist imagining both the past and the future. And I think presenting this sort of very poignant, um, bittersweet, image as a native person who was, you know, invested in the Wichita of his time, who did a lot to beautify it and help build it up, uh, most obviously by creating a uh, keeper of the plains, but at the same time acknowledging the history of um, displacement of native people. Right, it's a very different history from the first painting, you look, the C.A. Sewer painting that's, you know, oh, look at this early history, and it's like the very first you know, settler constructed buildings, whereas Black Bear Bosom is going even further than that. Uh, this, it's in Wham's collection, and I don't think it's currently on view. It's, it's uh, I don't think, I think they're putting it up soon again, though. It's, it's a work on paper, so it's not up for very long, because it's more sensitive. Uh, but I think it's going up again pretty soon. But it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful work. And it's pretty big too, yeah, it's like it's, this big, yeah. Um, it had been on view uh, in the last four years. I originally saw it in a small show that they did of work by Native American artists mm -hmm. and was really excited to see it. Um, so it goes on view intermittently, but it's not part of the permanent display. Yeah. Yeah, so Ksenia mentioned that we do have some info on Black Bear Bozen on exhibit, and this is what we have. It's right outside on the second floor that you're on right now. 
Um, so we have some of his, we have, you know, some things about um, the Keeper of the Plains. And actually, the Keeper of the Plains is the only sculpture that Black Bear Bozen did. He was more um, illustrator, um, so more like the two-dimensional painting here and the painting you just saw was more his style. Um, but he was commissioned to do the um, Keeper of the Plains. And so the only sculptures that he's done are just the mock-ups of it. And then he worked with an engineer in town to create the final sculpture. And um, the importance of the placement of the Keeper of the Plains, if you don't know, is that when the Wichita tribe was uh, here, they were settled in where the um, Arkans Arkansas River and the Little Arkansas River meet. Um, and so that's where the keeper is placed. So it's kind of like where the tribe originally lived. Um, another, um, the, I, as I was going through upstairs, uh, sort of this was another example where something that may even seem like a very neutral historical image to us can be reinterpreted or seen from a different perspective in a pretty dramatically different way. Mm -hmm. um, so these are images and, and the text um, upstairs talks about, you know, how much the, um, the, the, the white settlers who established Wichita wanted the train to come here, right? The train was the engine, literally and metaphorically, of economic development. Um, and so this map, where is it? There it is. The yeah, little the train at the bit. top shows the shows the shows the um, uh, the train passing through. And then there is this um, photo, 1872 photograph of the Santa Fe train. Um, and we think of you know trains as a fairly neutral you know means of transportation. But from the perspective of Native Americans who were displaced from here, trains were a disaster. <laughs> um, trains brought people in much larger numbers, and the creation of train lines was one of the means, as well as the introduction of private property for land uh, and farming instead of um, you know, uh, seasonal hunting. All of these like, really, really dramatic life ways um, made it, it was an either or, it was impossible to maintain both of those things at the same time. And so images of the train, so I, I picked this work by Jean Quick to see Smith, who was um, a contemporary Native American artist. Uh, this is a, um, uh, a portfolio of prints that we have in the Allrich collection by her, and it's called the Survival Suite. It's four images, I'm showing you one of them. Um, and one, and they sort of, they're, again, they are interested in concepts rather than specific historic facts, but she's sort of interested in the four things that have helped Native communities to survive. And one of the images is called humor, and so you have these trickster figures that appear in any number of Native American mythologies. Uh, but at the bottom here, you have the image of the train and, you know, these figure, these sort of stick figurey figures running away, and it's sort of funny, but it's also very not funny because it depicts a very sad reality. But I thought um, it was striking sort of how, how much you can recontextualize um, an image of an object. Yeah, and the train was really, really essential to Wichita, as you mentioned, because without it, if they hadn't worked to get the train to come south and stop here, because it was in Newton originally, and if they hadn't made a south line here, we wouldn't have become a big city, really, like Newton would have, or wherever else it stopped would have. Um, so it's a really important part of Wichita and forming Wichita, but it also has this like back, this backstory to it as well. Um, these are some of the images of Native American objects um, upstairs, uh, which I thought, I think it's really important to integrate those, and I especially the ones that, I'm not sure if you have I them. I don't think I have them. Um, the, the clothes that were made by Griffin Stein's yeah, yeah. Uh, wife um, yeah. were really cool. Um, and we also had native objects in um, Myths of the West. Again, for us, it was, um, but it, something that I feel is very important um, when interpreting Native American objects is to treat them, you know, I think, 
Again, with our eyes, we might see this as purely ornamental, but there is a meaning to the materials, there is a meaning to the color schemes, there is a meaning to the pattern. Not to every single thing, it's not like always one-to-one, -one, right. uh, but there is very often a significance that I think if, if it's there, it needs to be discussed. So for us, um, the way we, again, because so much of what I was interested in was um, native perspectives, and especially native pr perspectives by contemporary living people who have strong feelings about this history, um, so we started with this painting by Jeffrey Gibson called Migration, and in response to it, when curating a case of Native American objects from the collection of the Holmes Museum, um, all of the objects responded to the theme of migration in some way, um, either because they were you know, moccasins and they literally were used um, by people who were migrating, um, although it's complicated because I think these particular moccasins come from um, the upper Midwest based oh. on the pattern we can say that they come from the from the uh, Great Lake area mm -hmm. where people were not migratory uh, but there there's a story there too about the way that you know we've come to sort of conflate all people to to think of them as plains people who were migratory when in fact it was much more complicated and a lot of native people were uh, sedentary mm -hmm. um, there were two Diné Navajo woven rugs um, and uh, pots, these uh, ceramic pots um, by a ceramicist named, this is, this is what the painting looks like installed, um, by a ceramicist named Nampeo who called this particular uh, pattern that she and then her family in three generations uh, used on their pots, the migration pattern. Um, if you're interested, uh, I have a link here, and there will be a couple of other slides. We produced a number of videos in association with the exhibition where we discussed the history in, great, in greater depth than we could in the gallery. And so if you're curious, the links are here, or you can just go on the Ulrich's YouTube channel and look for Myths of the West, and all those videos are there. Mm -hmm. um, so then talking, yeah, you, you wanted me to put this whole text here. Yeah, well, so again, I was really interested and... Um, this, is, this is one whole label upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that I've, again, I'm really interested in this way that I think art in particular might be um, able to help us think about or understand or imagine something that didn't happen as well as something that did and why didn't it happen. So I was really struck in reading this text panel. Um, where was it? Um, so African Americans, the largest minority in town with about 150 people in 1878, were well organized politically and superficially accepted, but they had few opportunities for upward mobility. The overt hostility toward the Chinese limited their numbers to only four or five until much later in the century. Few Hispanics other than cowboys found their way to Wichita during the 1870s. So again, this I, 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 I really appreciated that whoever wrote this sort of talked about the people who weren't here as much as the people who were and why they, uh, you know, why they might not have wanted to or been able to come here. And there was a work in Myths of the West that, again, through satire, through kind of imaginative reinterpretation, talked about that. So this is from a, a portfolio called the Wild West by an artist named Warrington Colescott. And this was the first set of prints that I saw in our collection that sort of planted the seed in my head for like, oh, we should do something about the Wild West. Um, I find them really um, funny and also really incisive in their critique of, you know, sort of popular conceptions or misconceptions of the Wild West. So this one's called Home on the Range, so obviously very topical for Kansas, given that it's our state song. Um, but if you look very, very closely, it depicts, so there's, and it depicts, they are jarring, I think, because it depicts everybody in racial caricature, which is somewhat uncomfortable. Um, but it's sort of equal opportunity offender in that way. But in, a, in, a, in, um, in addition to these white cowboy figures, um, there is also 
a figure who is Asian and a figure who is African American here. And so I thought this was an interesting way. And the work, this, this, this portfolio was created in 1969, sort of he was creating it just a few years after the um, establishment of the American Indian Movement. He was working in Wisconsin. Um, so you know, he wasn't doing it in the last few years. He was doing it at a time when this was not a majority opinion or a popular opinion. But I appreciated that it at least was some way, again, in the absence of other works and local collections that could talk about it, but to talk about the presence of African Americans and especially Asian Americans in the West, because as I'm sure most of you know, um, Chinese immigrants were instrumental to building the aforementioned railroad, right, coming from the Pacific coast to the center of the country. Um, and then another way in which uh, we sort of get dealt with stereotypes and attitudes, um, and this is something that I think would be available to the historical museum, but looking at period press, and we had a number of images by Thomas Nast uh, from Harper's Weekly that addressed uh, perceptions of Native Americans at the time and attitudes that again are sort of hard to capture in any other way, I think, except through either very, very long text <laughs> or art and um, kind of visual commentary. Um, oh, last, sort of along the same lines. Um, the last image that uh, from, um, uh, or another image from the Cole Scott portfolio, uh, which again I think is um, kind of very caustic and funny, but captures, it's called uh, Wagon Train, and again tries to capture something um, that's hard to define, but the basically the overblown fears of native attacks that um, white settlers who were going west uh, experienced, which historically we know were, like I said, overblown and inappropriate. You were much, much more likely to die of disease and starvation. It was a dangerous, perilous journey, but you were much more likely to die of disease and starvation than you were in an Indian attack. But you know, you have these Indians in tanks and elephants and just <laughs> um, very uh, ridiculous scenarios. Yeah, and then um this is uh, an image of Fabrique Noli and his unidentified nurse, um, which is one of the few um, you know, photographs of a Native person, or not a Native person, an African-American person um, in early Wichita, and you know that she is unidentified and we can't find her name anywhere. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's both telling that she's unidentified, but it's also really important that it's one of the objects on view showing early Wichita, um, as well as, um, do we have the cowboy image? As yeah. well as this image, which I also really appreciated um, seeing. So that this was another thing, again, cannot emphasize this enough, drawing on what's available to us, uh, but, um, another history that was really important for us to tell was the fact that, you know, the settlement of the West was not all white and that African Americans participated in it actively and um, um, sort of were um, very engaged by it in some, way, in some ways because it happened or it um, really took off in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War when going west was often the most um, economically viable route for newly freed uh, slaves, but who didn't own land and didn't, if they didn't want to stay in the south. Um, this was a massive painting, so for scale, this is an installation image, a massive painting that we recently acquired at the Elridge called the 10th, um, the 10th meaning the 10th Cavalry Regiment, which was established right after the Civil War here in Kansas, I believe it was first based in Fort Leavenworth, and then eventually as the west, as the frontier of where the west was shifted west, they relocated to Texas. Um, but they were an all African American regiment that fought extensively in the Indian Wars in the post-Civil War era. And so this was a way of telling the history of, um, again, sort of a very 
complicated and messy history of one marginalized group, right, African Americans being enlisted to participate in a war that, you know, they wouldn't have started on their own, but in the Indian Wars to basically clear out the West of Native people. Um, and I also, um, so, and I appreciated what it, about this painting, the scale of it, that, you know, it, it uses the scale and techniques of traditional history with a capital H painting to tell that story and that you really get kind of, um, you feel connected, you feel invested with the individuals depicted in it. And I think it's also powerful in the way that it, um, you know, it doesn't depict a particular battle, it doesn't depict a specific event, but you get a, se a general sense of the fog of war, like you get the experience of these individuals participating in it. Um, um, similarly, and I think the History Museum does a really good job interpreting the history of cowboys and who they were. Um, uh, this was a fun fact. You, were, you know the word buckaroo? It's a weird word. It's a corruption of the Spanish vaquero, which speaks to the fact that cowboys were as much uh, Mexican as they were American, and in fact, a lot of them were um, Mexican-American. Um, and also, as many as one in five cowboys in the Old West were African-American, which is something that sort of completely gets lost in, so in um, popular media popular media representations of the cowboys that we get in movies in the early, from the early 20th century on. Um, but so the Historical Museum talks about that here in this display, and we talked about that through this painting called Black Cowboys by Jacob Lawrence, who was one of the great African-American artists of the 20th century, very interested in reclaiming histories of um, major events in African-American history. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's a video on, the, on that one as well on the YouTube channel. Yeah, and then um, talking more about Cowtown, um, we do have a section upstairs kind of around when Wichita was a cow town, which I like to tell tours a lot of times, like, yeah, well, you, think, you think of us as being a cow town, but we were only a cow town for like four years. It wasn't very long. Um, so that's something that we have to tell people as well. And um, talking about, you know, the the tri the cowboys coming in and, you know, telling them about, you know, a lot of the cowboys were really, really young. They were like 15, some of them. And talking about, you know, oh, we have this image of the Wild West in our minds of... Um, you know, and we touch on that a little bit in the second floor room as well, um, of like the Lone Ranger, that's the name. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, so that's what a lot of people think of, of the Wild West, but then, you know, having these images presented to the kids of like, these are real cowboys, and like, do, they don't really look like the Lone Ranger at all. Um, and then also, this is another section that kind of touches on um, when we were a cow town, and kind of the um, whole, fact of Delano. So Delano uh, district was where um, the cow town was. Um, and that's where the cowboys uh, ate and slept and gambled and like took a break, danced, had, you know, had sex. Had sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> and um, so this is kind of where that touches on this whole kind of party gambling place to unwind. And the people who lived in Wichita were not really a fan of this, even though it was their main source of income at the time, um, because, uh, you know, they were like, oh, these ruffians are coming into town. So they would actually have to check their guns at the Arkansas River in order to cross into the rest of town if they wanted, because the town didn't want them, you know, causing trouble anywhere else. Um, so that was also interesting. And yeah, Kansas or Wichita had really strict gun laws at the time. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, because the Cowtown has the original Munger house there. And I guess they're building a the carriage house too oh and the church that's neat yeah well so related to that the image that 
kind of captured some of that history. Um, um, in our show, it wasn't about Wichita, but it was about Dodge City, which in the grand scheme of things is pretty close. Um, <laughs> and, um, and again, this is from that same portfolio. I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, from the same portfolio, A Wild West by uh, Warrington Colescott. And, you know, what I appreciated and kind of wanted to highlight in the show about this image is that the, the thing looming over everything else in the image is this giant female figure. And as Sam was saying, the, you know, and the same, the same attitude and kind of history played out in Dodge City as did here, where on the one hand, you know, the founding fathers of the city and the kind of the, the power elite um, were not happy about the idea of vice coming into the city. On the other hand, they really needed the money. And so they were perfectly fine with, you know, in a Christian town uh, with isolating sex work in a particular place and taxing it rather than trying to eliminate it altogether. And for Dodge City, as for Wichita, the sex work of women was a really important uh, economic engine early on in its, in its history, and I feel like we tend not to talk about that. <laughs> and when we represent women's history, we don't very often uh, incorporate that, and I kind of appreciated the... Um, yeah, and Wichita taxed it too, so then they had way lower income taxes, um, or not income taxes, prop property taxes in town. Because they were like, oh, we can just tax this and right. make enough money. And I think what happens in both Dodge City and Wichita is that they sort of, Dodge City too, and this was fascinating to me, um, sort of having to learn a little bit about Dodge City because of this print um, and because Dodge because there was a, we did a lot of research related to popular culture representations of this era that happens then for a much, much longer period of time in the 20th century than the era actually lasted. Um, but um, the show Gunsmoke, right? Um, <laughs> before my time, but, yeah, I, don't, but I know it was important and I know it was popular. Um, but Gunsmoke actually ran on TV for longer than Dodge City was, a, was you know, a wild west cow town like it by by like a substantial margin like i think dodge city had a period of eight to ten years when it was like that and then Gunsmoke runs on tv for something like 25 years um but and, and then what so what happens in both dodge city and wichita is you know the city sort of um wichita ceases to be a cow town very quickly dodge city i think eventually does too um and once the city sort of outgrows that phase the sex work goes away it was also really interesting because there was kind of this contention between the cattle drivers and the farmers, the local farmers, because the farms were taking up space that the cattle could come through and get into town. And because it was such an economic thing for a short time, but at the time it was their main uh, source of income, they were like, oh, why, why are these farmers taking up so much space? But it was interesting too because then the cow town fades away and the farmers are here to stay, right? And it became the main source of income for Wichita after we weren't a cow town anymore. So it's also this weird contention. You want to talk about this? Yeah, so then um, another area on this floor, on the second floor, that we have um, objects kind of related to this talk is um, this case over here has a collection of toys that one person owned. Um, so it's all of his toys kind of on display. And um, uh, this is like kind of probably half of it almost. And a lot of it, it has to do with like playing Indian, playing cowboys and Indians, that kind of thing. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, I uh, I'm like, oh, this is like not great anymore, right? <laughs> and it's like this contention of, well, you can't get rid of it because that's history. You know, people people played that, but at the same time, where are we interpreting like what that means now and kind of the how we've evolved from that or how we've kind of moved on from this kind of caricature? Um, and related to that, as I've alluded to before, for for me, like again, one of the topics that emerged from the works that were in the show, um, but it was one of the bigger ones that sort of came up over and over, was how much 
the popular culture and media representation of this period shapes what we think about it, you know, rather than a visit to the historical museum. So this is another one of the Warrington Colescott prints called High Noon for Hoot Gibson. So even before this, again, I didn't know this before, but there was a whole, there were there sort of like multiple waves of film stars representing cowboys. So I didn't know who Hoot Gibson was, but he was a silent actor. <laughs> uh, he was a silent era actor who makes his career uh, representing cowboys. And as, as often, like, you know, this is true of Charles Russell, he did have a personal history connected to it. Growing up, he rode horses. I think he came from a farm. So he did have, you know, kind of personal experience of some of that lifestyle. Um, but uh, he's in the first wave in the first generation of movie stars that um, make the hundreds of cowboy films, cowboy pictures that are made in the early 20th century. And then in the second wave and generation, you get people like John Wayne and then, you know, uh, Clint Eastwood is still alive. <laughs> Maybe that's the last wave of, you know, major, major cowboy depictions in popular media. But, you know, I, again, I think Cole Scott kind of wryly does a good job of capturing the essential, you know, the shoot 'em up quality of those movies, the way that they hinge on violence, uh, which, as Sam was saying, you know, uh, was not actually at the time um, something that uh, people promoted or were enthusiastic about. Um, another work, sorry. Um, another work that talked about that in a kind of roundabout way is this image by John Lawrence Doyle, uh, where it's an imaginary figure. It's a woman, as near as I can tell, um, and kind of imagining a female cowboy who didn't exist, but I think also urging us to ask why. And um, I didn't go deep into this history, but I think there could be a really interesting project. Um, there is, I think, more and more research coming out about uh, trans people in the West and the fact that the West was a place where if you were coming from the East, you could come and change your identity completely, including your gender. And there are a number of documented cases of you know, people born male who lived their whole life as women and uh, vice versa. And you know, you wouldn't really be found out often until you died. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Or you know, felt very ill and had to go to the doctor. But I think there's potentially a really interesting story there. Um, and lastly, this was um, for scale. These are very large. These are for Andy Warhol prints out of a larger portfolio called Cowboys and Indians. Again, sort of Andy Warhol is very much an artist we associate with you know, showing us how much our perception of reality is mediated by popular culture, um, hence pop art. Um, but it just so happened that the four prints from that larger portfolio that are all in Wichita, two are at the Elridge Collection, two are at, the, at WAM, they all connect in some way to the history of um, Wild West shows, which was the original popular culture form that helps to establish the tropes and the stories that then get passed down as the true story of the Wild West. And so um, Custer obviously dies um, at Little Bighorn, but then there are reenactments in Wild West shows traveling all over um, the country of Custer's last stand, and it's partly through that, as well as uh, Budweiser advertisement. Um, that that becomes kind of the seminal event in American history that gets passed down into textbooks. Geronimo is a Native American uh, warrior who gets captured and who gets trotted out at world's fairs and who is brought out as a kind of curiosity at uh, Theodore Roosevelt's presidential inauguration. And both um, Sitting Bull and Annie Oakley actually meet each other and become friends as part of um, Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, where they're among the attractions. Um, so there is a video about that as well, if you're interested more in the history of Wild West shows. And those are um, Edison, when he is first inventing um, cinematic technology in America, one of the very first films that we have on <coughs> film is a recording of a Wild West, of uh, kind of a, a film based on the biography of um, Buffalo Bill. So I found that really, really interesting how early on this history gets connected to cinematic history and then booms into this very influential genre. Um, I think we can wrap up in just a few minutes and then leave some time for Q&A. 
so as I said, um, for me it was really important to bring this into the present day. And so um, in addition to representing Black Bear Boson, who has a, who's a Native American artist with deep ties to Wichita, um, we had a number of works by other Native American artists with connections to Wichita, so Woody Crumbo, these wonderful prints of different uh, dances, uh, was educated here. He was from Oklahoma, but came for school here, studied at WSU, um, stayed for several years before moving on, but had a connection to Wichita um, and was somebody who practiced dance and music himself, as well as being a visual artist, and also created this very complex multi-screen, silkscreen process for these. He was truly um, a jack of all artistic trades. Um, Norman Akers, sort of again contrasting with how you depict a place versus the idea of a place. Norman Akers is a contemporary artist who works at KU um, with this wonderful image called Two Places, uh, which we also contrasted with this older uh, lithograph etching, I'm sorry, from our uh, collection. Uh, Edgar Heap of Burns grew up in Wichita, now lives in Oklahoma where he had taught for a number of years. Um, a contemporary artist who works in this format, like sort of very text on background, very stark images, um, but very important work. And um, Chris Papan, who lives in Chicago, but who is CA and who is deeply involved with the movement here locally, you know, I forget how many miles outside of Wichita, but the Ka Nation purchased some land and is trying to establish a cultural center that connects them to what they consider to be their homeland. Um, and um, uh, I want to say that in the fall, we're hoping to bring um, a speaker to talk at the Ulrich about the Sacred Red Rock Project. So that's part of that initiative. There is a large red rock, which was sacred to the Kaw, which was moved from its original location in the late 19th century to a park in Lawrence, in which the city of Lawrence has now officially returned to the Kaw, in which they're working on physically moving. It's a large number of tons, I forget how many. But they're working on officially moving the rock to this newly established cultural center. Um, so if you're interested in some of the contemporary initiatives around um, Native culture locally. I, I would urge you to come to the Ulrich for that. Uh, Sydney Purcell is a contemporary artist, uh, works at the, uh, went to KU and works at the Spencer Museum actually. Um, and I can skip the, over this um, so that we have time for questions. Thank you.